I first met Gisela at Geek Girl Meetup many, many years ago when she was still a student at the Industrial Economics and Management program. Since then, she's gotten a PhD and she's now written this brilliant book called Ostad, which in English translates into being undisrupted. And she's going to be talking with us today a bit about how to manage your cognitive workload. A big warm welcome to you, Gisela Beklander. Welcome to How the Pod. first podcast I'm doing in in English. That's going to be interesting. Well, I think you're going to do very well because you seem to speak it. I sp- I hopefully speak it enough. I mean, I write also write my research in English. Yeah. So some of the terms should be easier. But now, since the book is in Swedish, I'm used to sort of talking about the ideas in Swedish. So we'll see. Yeah. <laughs> Who knows? Maybe it will be translated into English. I I would hope so. That would be amazing. But I don't know. It may be too s- sort of too Swedish. I don't know. <laughs> oh, you mean like the cu- the cultural context? Well, the culture and the laws are different. Not that I talk that much about the laws, but I do sort of have it sort of in the background. And I studied people, you know, in Stockholm. Basically, it's like it's so I can't get away from that. I feel like it's presumptuous to say like, oh, everyone should just, but some of the basic things, I mean, about the cognitive resources and everything, that's more universal, obviously, but there may be more international researchers maybe who write about that in for the English market. I think it's super interesting for a lot of people from other countries very much because Sweden is an interesting place to look at for perspective. Mm. Due to us having a different culture and a very specifically different culture. Yeah. Um, without putting any value into that, I think it's... And I think that's what kind of in one way drove me to start this podcast because I know that so many people in the U.S. kind of look to Sweden for perspective. Mm. So that's also why I wanted to do this with you. Okay. Yes. Interesting. <laughs> it's good because I, I do I do want to argue sometimes when I like try to publish my research. Like this is interesting um, because it's in Sweden because we are like extreme self leader <laughs> like types um, to a degree. Like we have a lot of expectations of autonomy and. Uh, we have more rights in relation to um, the employer and I, those things matter, I think. We're both high on collaboration and working in teams and high on sort of independence and taking a lot of like your own responsibility. What would be the opposite? What would be the opposite? Um, I mean, being so more hierarchical, basically, Almost every other culture in the world is more hierarchical <laughs> than Scandinavian, uh, the Scandinavian countries, or especially Sweden and Denmark. Um, so, so I think it would be more like you expect the manager to um, maybe have the answers if you need them, or just having more like position authority than maybe you'd have in Sweden. And also some of the managers that I interviewed in the research were Americans and they were like, well, so I was like, what would you do if uh, if someone is insufficiently self-leading that we were talking about? And he was like, well, in America, I would fire them, <laughs> but I can't do that here. So I tried to push them uh, to another department. Uh, that's what, That was his like way of doing it. And, I, and then I felt like, yeah, This would just be like a different conversation if it was in if 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 it was in America and you could just fire people uh, who you feel are not performing, but in Sweden you you can't really do that. So you have to think of other ways to help people perform. And how do good leaders do that? How they help others perform? Um, well, uh, so. 
Okay, so in the study I'm talking about, I asked managers about like how, um, what do you mean when you say you want like, your employees to be like self-leading or sort of driven or taking this lots of initiative? What does that look like? And then how do you sort of increase that in your organization? And if you have this particular American manager's point of view, then the way that you would do that is simply that you hire people who are like that and you fire people who aren't like that. But the other kind of perspective that I found in most organizations is more that, well, it depends both on, you know, the individual and that you want to um, take responsibility for your own work, but also that you have good conditions for doing that, which means being clear about roles and responsibilities, being clear about how, um, like, if you ne- if you can't solve a problem on your own, you can't solve it together with a colleague, then, you know, there should be a clear way, like, how do you escalate something to a manager, for example? And in, in one of the studies, uh, I was talking to people at Spotify, they talked, this was years ago, so it could have changed like a million times, maybe. Uh, but then they had like, oh, we have this, uh, like red flag mailbox, where it's like, if you mail there, then you will get a response from a manager in 24 hours about like how to proceed. So if you have some trouble that you can't, and I'm sure people were not mailing there with just whatever like it's probably if you have a very tricky problem but you need manager eyes on it uh, right now so uh, the my point would be that leaders who want to enable self leadership in other people and maybe we will talk more about this um, later but they need to think about sort of how interpretable is this situation that people are in like how can we make work um clearer and it doesn't mean like the manager goes in and just makes it more clear but that you have these opportunities for coordinating and sort of airing your problems with others and so you so that you can see what are the problems that we we have that we have to work through uh, or like what is blocking us or what is the next step here and not just assume, because if you don't talk about those things, people will have their own way of thinking about it, and you're not sort of synchronizing it across uh, the organization on different levels. And that makes self-leadership either more difficult, because you're not as clear about what is the main priorities here, and what sort of mandate do I have, like what degrees of freedom, um, or it can, you know, lead to sort of sub optimizations where I'm leading myself from my point of view and what I think is important in the organization. But if we haven't synchronized it across the team or the department or talked about those things, then there's a risk that we're all, you know, leading ourselves in different directions. So that's so great. We've kind of just jumped into everything all at once. I love it. And that's the interesting part about your research, because I think just about everyone or anyone can and will relate to the addressed issue. Like everybody's been in a company where we have a leader or we are leading and we're lacking in our communication skills. Um, And I know that you talk about a paradox Do you want to talk? Would you like to tell me more about that? Yeah, so I think you're thinking about the autonomy paradox, which is an appealing name, like it draws (laughs) the eye. Um, And that's a term, I think, invented by researchers talking about this tendency in working life, at least in these areas of the um, job market that I'm looking at, which is more knowledge workers, you would say. It could be others, but that's who I feel sort of qualified to really talk about. And this autonomy paradox is about this trend to uh, to have increasing freedom, increasing autonomy, and also having choice in like uh, how you spend your time. Like you often don't have to be at work at a specific hour, and 
often don't even have to come into the office. You can decide where you work and these times. And um, to some degree also like who are you working with? What am I, what am I working with? I mean, it, it depends sort of on your job. So there's this sort of drift towards uh, fewer sort of structures and regulations around work in some sense and a greater autonomy. But this is sort of enabled by a greater um, reliance on technology and uh, mobile phones, email, being able to, uh, you know, connect to the work um, IT system, to, to the network uh, from home, for example. So you have all these devices and technologies that enable you to not have to be in the office at a particular uh, hour because everything is like locked in there and happening in there. But the paradox then comes from having these greater sort of freedoms um, seems to lead to, I mean, it not seems to, like it do does lead to, if you look at like how do people like this work, it does lead to working more and um, maybe checking your email uh, like throughout the entire day or so that's like the paradox is like you're talking about more autonomy but the autonomy to like work anywhere at any time becomes working everywhere all the time and that's uh, or like a tendency towards towards um, that and that is what they call uh, the autonomy paradox and that's why that's part of why I wrote the book <laughs> that I wrote because I wanted to speak to this problem and how you can sort of try to win back some boundaries um, when when there are no boundaries you kind of you have to make you have to make your own boundaries or it's going to be very intense <laughs> yeah and I so one example of this autonomy paradox that when it goes wrong we're accessible all the time and people get burnt out because you're still answering the messages coming in after five or at whatever time that you are working. And you never, and I would, I would say that there's two main things about this. Because I think we both like, kind of lived and worked fairly around the same time when all these things were new. Like Twitter was literally new. Facebook was new. And I found that I literally had to like go to another room without any devices to get my work done. If I was to like write a text or a technical instruction, or put some things together, I didn't get that moment. And I would get interrupted either by devices or physical people like tapping me on the shoulder. So I would literally have to hide. <laughs> and that's also being like the well-connected knowledge worker. And so one thing is like minding your time, but also at work, like carving out pockets and fighting for that, which is basically what you're saying. But um, but then also after work. Yeah, so I think there are two <clears throat> perspectives often on this and, and they do get mixed because of this autonomy par paradox because life and work is blending into each other uh, but, but, but that's one part like separating work from the rest of your life uh, and the other part which is what I talk m mostly about in this book is what you also talk about sort of separating um, stuff inside of work so that you get time to do this sort of de deeper thinking, deep work. It's been called by Cal Newport, uh, who wrote the book with that name, which I think is is a perfectly fine way to talk about it. <laughs> and that you have to, um, either if you're going to write something, like you're writing research or you're writing a book, but also said like technical documentation or that you need to like, you're going to create something. You're not just following some instruction or doing something that you've done, you know, a hundred times before. It's like, I have to think because I have to put these things together. I'm creating a course or I'm creating a podcast and I'm having an idea like I need to put something down here. And and you can't really do that if your time and your attention is completely 
fragmented between these different things. And I think one part of these, or one aspect to these uh, disruptions that you're talking about is that, well, if someone comes and taps you on the shoulder, then obviously you're being disrupted. So your attention and time is is being fragmented and, and disrupted. It's going to take you longer to finish whatever you were working on. That's one aspect of it. But the other sort of more devious aspect is even if, uh, even if no one is tapping you on the shoulder right now, but you are in a place where you know that at any time someone could tap you on the shoulder, um, that actually creates a kind of tax on your cognitive resources as well, because you're kind of, for your brain to sort of handle these like possibilities that could happen, and you know that they do frequently happen, it creates this kind of vigilance or like you're you're ready for this thing you have to be you have to uh, put some of your capacity on like portion it to be ready for these kinds of things to happen so it creates a kind of tax on your ability to concentrate and put everything on what you're working on even if it doesn't actually happen um, uh, as if creating things wasn't taxing enough Exactly. You know, you don't want to pay extra tax, extra attention tax to things that could be scheduled. Yes. Yes, mm. exactly. And and that's where, because a lot of these things, you have to make some a space for them, even for, well, either for talking to other people or even allowing for the possibility of being interrupted, like I have a time where I am here and I am available for interruptions. <laughs> but it's it's a much better, like you say, to try to schedule that time and to not have it be the default because then it's that you get this this um, time to do the the deeper work or the more difficult work. You're not going to get the concentrated time to do that unless you take it because everyone else who's coming to you with different things, they're not coming to you with, with that. They're coming to you with other things. So that's why I think it's so important to try to schedule time for the for interruptions. It maybe sounds <laughs> ironic, but I think that's a very good idea. So I find, because I work in tech, so one thing that I've noticed is that when you work in the tech environment or in a tech environment, it's much more common that you have like scheduled stand-ups where, you know, it's it's scheduled for 15 minutes, maybe during a certain launches, 30 minutes. So you meet, you meet at 8.30 and everybody's like, I've done this, I'm doing this, I have questions for X, Y, Z about this. Let's think afterwards. And everybody pitches in. And then you've kind of cleared the air. And then when you work with less technological projects, which happens in, you know, sometimes as a consultant, uh, the amount of interruptions rises drastically. Um, ha have you seen anything like that, that there's a culture difference between how scheduled problem solving or scheduled questions appear? Yes, I think so. So this is not, um, I don't have any evidence of this, <laughs> but but I share your like observation, even as a researcher. Um, I do think that is true. And I've thought about like, why is this? <laughs> and um, I mean, part of it, I guess the culture has become that way. I think in, in, in Many technological um, companies, and especially like with programmers, and I don't know. I guess it feels maybe it's more obvious for them somehow that you need this uninterrupted time to do your work. And I think it can be like a good thing that you have this work that is so easily disrupted <laughs> that you have to become very ferocious about trying to protect that sort of uninterrupted time. And I, I talk, um, I think I talk about it in the book, at least I've talked about it when I talk about the book, is that, I mean, you have some of these, the really like uh, deep work that I'm really um, thinking about is that, I mean, it's so 
taxing. It's so cognitively demanding that you basically, you almost can't do it at all if you don't, uh, if you're not able to focus. Like there are some fairly difficult things. It's like, well, if I have poorer concentration, um, the quality is going to be lower, but I'm still going to get the thing done. Um, but some tasks are like that demanding that you're you're not even really like you're going to have big trouble doing them like at all uh, if you're if you're not really there and concentrating while you're doing it. And the good thing about those kinds of that tasks is that it becomes. Uh, I mean, it becomes more apparent that you you really, really need these uh, stretches of time. If you can do something, but it's just like with lower quality, then it's not going to be as clear to to like the organization that they're really missing out on this big productivity um, increase maybe that it could have if people were able to concentrate better. Um, so I, that might be a part of it. I don't think that programmers are like the only people who need to focus at work <laughs> so i so i i don't know why exactly they have been so uh, but i feel like there i mean there's a whole i mean movement within within like that culture that has like their own productivity and and f- focused ideas and, and examining their work in in this way which i i think is good good for them and i think others could learn from it. Uh, And I think one of the points in my doctoral thesis, uh, where I've been looking then at like, the demand for self leadership, and how do people deal with it? What are different um, sort of challenges of trying to be very self leading? And then I was also looking at more like self leading teams. And then I was looking at Spotify, as I said, um, a, a couple of years ago, and looking at what their agile coaches were doing specifically. And um, to me, it appeared like having this more sort of agile paradigm, you could say, was different from having a like very more individual self leadership paradigm, if we would call it that, and that they had more of these um, explicit um, structure making activities. (laughs) And so I think, for example, having a a daily stand up that is 50 minutes, not like you're not sure how long it's going to run for, but it's like it is 15 minutes or you have like, I think just having a set, like this meeting is going to be this long um, and that you can trust that. That is a very good thing. And to have this sort of regular, um, it doesn't have to be every day, but you have regular things where you know that, well, we can air these kinds of things at that time. So you don't have to go interrupting people all the time uh, and you don't have to be available you don't have to be mentally available to be interrupted um, at all these different times and another thing I think I also learned from the agile setting is having this kind of like a, a goalkeeper or gatekeeper who's like if you want to talk to this team you have to talk to this person uh, and you can rotate that who that person is from different weeks but then it's like so you're not going to have like this just access to ev- anyone in the team who you just want to interrupt i mean all these interruptions it sounds like it's a bad thing usually of course they are for a good reason <laughs> yeah the intention is always yeah. good <laughs> but that you have and then everyone else in the team knows that they can relax then knowing that they will not be interrupted whenever and also, people are different, so some people are very sensitive to just the the possibility of being interrupted that it poses like a big tax on them, and other people maybe are better at just um, not caring about that. But so I think having this like, if you want to talk to anyone in this team, first you have to talk to this person, and they will assess whether you can talk to this person or not, or like when is a good time to talk to them. Mm. And also one thing that this makes me think, especially when I was younger, I was the go-to person because I was one with more technical knowledge than the rest of that organization. And there's there's nothing bad with that, but I think I didn't understand how taxing it was. 
And I was like, oh, yeah, sure, I'll help you with this. Because, of course, I wanted to help because then they wouldn't come back. But <laughs> they always came back. They always came back. And I really learned that you have to teach people how to treat you. Yeah. Because I'm literally telling them, if you come and interrupt me, I will allow you to do this forever and ever. Yeah. Which is, I mean, as as we mentioned earlier, I mean, it is the intention is always good. But and what ended up happening was that I had this meeting every week where I would teach them the basics, like one thing every week for 15 minutes as a meeting that was called like new is now. And the HR manager like bought coffee and cinnamon rolls. And that way everybody came and they were like, oh, it's not dangerous about all this new stuff. Um, but yeah. So how would you suggest, or you were... You were no, I think it's amazing that you you did that. It sounds like you solved the problem, sort of, in a very good way. There's this, uh, well, we, researchers like to, you know, make up this catchy names for everything. <laughs> so <laughs> there's this thing called the collaboration overload, <laughs> which was sort of happening to you, where like, uh, and can easily happen to someone who is either very competent or like they have knowledge that other people in the organization need um, and or they're very helpful. <laughs> so people want to ask that person because they know that they will help them. And 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 you want to help. I mean, of course you want to help. Do you like do you want to work in a company where people help each other? Yes, obviously. So that's very like uh, a good thing. But the, the, these people can easily get overloaded trying to help others and um, maybe that's not something that they want like maybe they actually do want to do their own tasks as well and so either i mean they could start to perform less well in their like in their own work and if everyone is sort of fine with that then i guess there's nothing wrong with the situation but you could also be as you say kind of taxing to be always helping someone and then what people and you see that if this comes over some specific threshold that I don't, I don't have that number in my head, unfortunately, um, then people are going to be more likely to be burnt out and more likely to leave the company if they have this very high sort of incoming people asking them questions all the time. And um, ways to tr sort of try to solve this is like, well, maybe you can like write an FAQ of like, what are the things that people are coming to asking me about? Where like you did, like, okay, so I'm going to teach you like every week, um, I will sort of help you with these kinds of things. Or even if it's like, well, I can help you with your questions. I have like office hours at Fridays at 10 and <laughs> something. So that's a so practical to, thing. Yeah, like trying to confine like where is this and maybe you need to talk to your manager or like especially if you're a more junior person then maybe it's good to talk to your manager about this like how are we um, going to sort of work with this uh, problem and I think but I think it's very good and it's, it's a the organization should be interested in like obviously that knowledge is uh, Shared. Yeah, it's like it's valuable and you want it. Yeah, you want it to be shared in the organization. And so you don't have this bottleneck uh, person who is then very heavily taxed. <laughs> yeah, we instituted that. I think it was like, no, now this was a very long time ago, but I think we did like on Wednesdays up until lunch, you, there was no meetings. And we would just work. And you, as an outsider of that team, you were not allowed to come in. And that I, that was, of course, born out of pure frustration. But I think I was lucky to have a super progressive boss and a super progressive CEO. And those two guys were both, like, super encouraging. And they were like, yeah, well, let's just try this. Let's just... And that was in... For me, that was... And I was so young at the time. So I was like, okay, well... We can just try everything, and that was fine. Mm -hmm. But I could also imagine that there are organizations where you're not that young at mind, and you're not you don't have that level of openness. So how would you, if you're, you know, 25 and you're addressing those types of things as a young, ambitious person, mm -hmm. and you might have a not as young at mind leader? How would you, 
what do you think would be the best thing to do? Um, for finding time to focus or if yeah, people are... Ad addressing asking. that I am getting interrupted and I understand that the intention is good, but maybe, you know... And also, maybe you don't know yourself how to structure it. How would you address that with a boss? Yeah, I mean, yeah, depending on, I think for most people who are knowledge workers, there is some assumption that you do have some say in like how you structure your own day and that you maybe don't have to look at your email inbox like every second of every day. And if you're not sure like how much to to sort of pull that down, then you could talk to your manager, I guess, about like, well, what what are the expectations of my availability? Um, like, if you have something where you need to answer quickly or or not. I mean, I've personally, I haven't really had those kinds of jobs where it's that important. And if you have something that's sort of timed, that's been within a specific um system like lotus notes <laughs> i think it would come in like these uh service tickets or something that you were supposed to be working on but then that's pretty structured and the thing is like when you have something like that where, where you ha then you all usually have some kind of service level agreement like so it's much more explicit like how um when a ticket comes in like how fast does someone have to answer it and we usually don't have that kind of explicitness around like when someone sends you an email how fast do you have to answer it and uh, that's like just one example so i feel like if you have trouble somehow i think there are two ways it depends on if you're are you like more like i want to do things by the book kind of person or if you're a more sort of bold <laughs> person let's try it and see what happens uh so i think you have like those <laughs> two main strategies either like you go you go to your manager then and you say like i i i guess you could say like i find it hard to to concentrate on my work when i have to there's so much email like how much am i expected to keep up with with emails or i get interrupted a lot do i have to be in the office all the time or could i work for from a different location or like to, to talk about. And if you are young, then that I would say you don't have that much to lose uh, asking these kind of questions. I think managers are more tolerant of young and new people asking these kinds of questions uh, without losing, uh, like without appearing that you can't deal with your work. Like I think man managers are more accepting that young people have these kinds of questions and need some help sort of to manage manage things. I think the other strategy, as I was saying, is to just try stuff and see what happens. <laughs> I mean, um, especially then uh, in Sweden, as you're, you're not likely to like be fired because something, something went wrong. Um, so, I mean, if you feel like, well, I can't um, keep up with this all the time, I'm just not going to do that. I'm going to check my email once a day at this hour or something or like however much you think you have to do that or to to be work from different locations or like to just do some of the things that you think you need to be able to do your work well. I mean it's not like you're you you're not trying to cheat the company out of anything. You're just trying to do your job and like giving yourself better conditions for doing that, which should be in the interest of everyone. So I think that's absolutely like a viable idea is to, you know, you don't have to ask permission to, to turn your phone off. I mean, unless you do, <laughs> but then that should be explicit. So I think um, if you sort of challenge some of the ideas you have about how available you think you have to be and then see like how available do you actually have to be and try to make that more explicit so you know like th these things are important I really have to say on top of these things these things are not as important as the other things yeah that's a great answer 
So when it comes to the explicit defined or work that you called undesigned, uh, how do you manage? I mean, and it's really like the leader's job to manage the expectation or lead a workshop, I'm guessing, where you kind of, how are we going to do this together? Um, how common is that? To have undesigned work or yeah. underdesigned. Um, I mean, I think in the knowledge work space, it's very common. And what I call underdesigned work is basically work where you don't have a clear role description, for example. I also, again, talking about myself, I don't think I've ever had like this is like this is your job. This is not your job. Um, like super clear, even though I think by law you can you sort of have to have that. But I think most people in this space don't have that, um, and that means that the sort of the boundaries of your role is something that either you have to make a decision about yourself on a daily basis, like, is this part of my job or is this not part of my job and I'm working on these things? Or um, you sort of can have ideas about the boundaries of your job because of how, for example, are the, the questions that people ask you. Now that's suddenly part of your job, right? Because someone came and asked you. So, but that's also having, having these more kind of fussy boundaries. You don't have them like, this is your role. I'm making a square with my hands right now for Heidi. So like you have it within this box. It's much more fussy and like in sort of socially constructed, you could say like, but depending on how other people, what other people think your job is. I mean, I think a lot of people can find for example, that they, well, maybe that they spend a lot of time answering some kind of questions that they don't enjoy doing and they feel like, is this really part of my job? Can I, can I say no? I think that's a question that people ask themselves. <laughs> like how I, I had in one of my studies, which was on consultants, and they said like, I have some work tasks, like I'm not really sure how they became my responsibility, but somehow... <laughs> <laughs> somehow it was now my responsibility to do these things. Um, so that's just part of this, what, what is a sort of under-designed um, work. And I would say that it is, is very common. And it's not under-designed in the, in the sense that it should be much uh, more clearly designed. It's just that you have to, well, as I said, either yourself or together with others sort of make these design decisions and you're usually not making them very explicitly. It's more implicit, but that is also a kind of work. So the, all of these sort of coordinations and like, who's going to do this? Is it you or me? Like that is also work. And the more of that that you have to do or you or your colleagues have to do, then obviously there's less time for sort of actually doing the actual work and that can be a problem if you think that you have to deliver you know like eight hours per day of actual work <laughs> but you also actually have to do all this kind of meta work around the work to to make the work work <laughs> <laughs> where it's like if you have to do a lot of that then you have to make some kind of allowance for um, then there's less time and energy to do uh, the other things. But we have to do these things as well. So it's just you have to manage the expectations around what is possible. So what's the core skill for a knowledge worker, let's say in university or while learning your core skill? What is the... So let's say I'm a developer or I'm a UX researcher. I'm, I'm learning about UX research. Uh, what is the core skill that I will need to learn in order to make the work work? Um, I think the main thing in a sort of general sense is about, I mean, being sort of perceptive and listening to other people, like being able to being able to really hear what people are saying without 
becoming defensive about it. So being like curious, I guess, would be, I think that is a very good um, s sort of state to be in, to be curious. You're very like, you're non-defensive, you are perceptive, you're taking in what's going on. You're being very realistic, actually, when you're being curious, you're willing to examine things without a lot of judgment. You're suspending judgment while you are hearing what someone is describing, for example. I think that is a very good skill to be able to work with other people, <laughs> which is probably what you'll be doing. Um, and it's also a good way to sort of relate to yourself, uh, to be curious about what is working for me. Like, is this, am I able to concentrate when I work like this or not? For example, that's what I talk some what I talk about in the book, and to not be very judgmental about yourself either, judging yourself like, well, I should be able to concentrate during this, or I should be able to um, work super focused for eight hours. And that that's not realistic. And like, if you need like a researcher to tell you right now that that's not realistic, <laughs> <laughs> to be like super yeah. focused. Um, so I think having this kind of sort of practicing curiosity, so trying to be curious, non-judgmental, and being relating to other people. And it, it is very important because this, if we're having this more sort of dynamic design of what the work is and what we're going to do and so on, um, that relies on this kind of interpersonal coordination, like mutual adjustments of expectations and how you communicate depends on like are they understanding what I'm saying and so on. Mm -hmm. So I think that is kind of being able to to listen and observe and then also in like the flip side of that being able to tr try to communicate clearly yourself and stating what you're thinking and like having a point of view being able to say that um, because then you're also bringing something to the table. Um, I think those are like, if, I, if it becomes kind of general, like what I think students should bring with them in working life, that's, I think, an important skill. Yeah. Can I add one thing? Hmm? And I would love to hear your feedback on this, even though I implicitly think that that is what you've, you are saying. But one thing that I've noticed is also to be able to ask when you don't understand something. So, oh, I, an example could be, oh, I see that there's a task here, but who's going to do that? Mm. Like, have we assigned someone for this? Yeah. And being okay with not knowing. Because I think sometimes we can, like, just assume that we know everything and then we might almost be king or I can see this sometimes that either I or others become afraid when there is no right answer because we haven't solved it yet and that's okay it's okay to not know yeah I think you're right on both those counts it's good to be I don't know comfortable but like take a breath <laughs> and, <laughs> and be like okay so we don't have all the answers so so you don't rush um uh, to answers uh, because you think you need them but actually maybe you don't need them yet like m many things are like they're happening sometime in the future and by the time we get there we will know better um, what to do for example because some options will be clearly not viable once we get there but trying to sort of plan it all out ahead of time is perhaps not possible and if you insist on doing it anyway then it's likely that you will make decisions that are not good for what will happen later and then we're back to the 80s and 90s and the waterfall method yes yeah, yeah. so do you want to tell me a bit about your book that's called Ostad in Swedish how would you translate that into English yes how would I translate that um I think I would call it, I would probably translate into like uninterrupted, um, that you have this sort of uninterrupted time, really. Um, and the, the subtitle is sort of principles for a focused work day. 
So it's, I mean, my it's based on the research I did on self leadership in organizations, but it's also based on research that I sort of dove into while I was doing my own research. So it's not just my own research because I haven't done that much research yet. <laughs> um, and that research is more about these cognitive resources that I talk about, like how um, how we are able to pay attention and what are the cognitive demands of the work that we're doing. And sort of one of the ideas that came up in my research and then really carried over to this book is about that if you have this very cognitively taxing work, but like the work itself is very cognitively taxing, you have to do difficult things where you have to concentrate and be creative. Um, maybe not like super creative, but you if you have to create something new, then you have to sort of be creative. Um, if you're all if you have this very cognitive taxing work, then trying to um, lead yourself and just basically doing this kind of meta work things and also like where deciding for yourself about your own work and trying to concentrate then if you're using very um, kind of internal strategies to do those things then they are competing for that same cognitive um, space that you need to do the actual work and that's where I think people become I mean if you if you are very cognitively taxed all the time then that becomes very stressful and can lead to burnout situations and um, also if you can regulate your behavior by using sort of more external strategies and you mentioned before that you said I had to go to another room uh, to be able to concentrate and do these things. And that's very clever to do that because then you like, I'm changing, um, I'm changing the situation where I'm trying to do these things. So instead of sort of staying in a situation and an environment that's not conducive to the thing you're trying to do, then you have to concentrate very hard. Like you have to be very cognitively controlled to try to resist all the things that's happening in that situation. And you can forego all of that by just changing the environment to something that is much more um, enabling you to do the things that you're trying to do. And so that's basically like, if it's just one point of the book, that is like the main point. It's like, if you can try to choose a different situation in a different environment, or you can try to modify the situation and the environment that you are in, then you can, um, if you if you do that with like having a lot of available cognitive capacity as the thing you're trying to sort of optimize for. So I mean, you can choose situations based on different goals, but in this case, the goal would be I need to have more available cognitive capacity, and then I choose in this way and try to do these things. Um, yeah, that's much more effective. It's more effective to to regulate your behavior if you can sort of just you don't have to resist these distractions or you don't have to resist these temptations. You just take them out of the equation. Then it becomes easier and then it becomes less cognitively taxing. And then also just sort of using different kinds of physical artifacts like tools and if you're using like a whiteboard or reading on paper or I mean also bringing it back to agile a lot of it is based on you know moving post-its <laughs> across a board for example and that's actually pretty good because it makes the progress of the work visible for everyone involved um, and it's less cognitively taxing than trying to keep up uh, sort of without any visible support. But of course, not, not everything that doesn't have a visual support instead becomes something you do in your head. Like a lot of it just doesn't happen at all then because out of sight is out of mind. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. So Gisela, I'm, I'm super curious about the, the research papers that you've written 
prior to the book mm-hmm. that led up to this. Would you mind telling us a bit about that? So, <clears throat> um, so the research papers are basically about... In a general way, they're all about the, this demand for people to be self-leading in organizations or more self-leading, like being able to manage themselves or lead themselves. And this meant, the first study was about asking, um, I was mostly talking to tech <laughs> companies in Stockholm, uh, managers about what they meant with this sort of term, like if, if they want these sort of self uh, managing employ- employees, what does that mean and what does it look like and how can you increase it? And like, how can you tell if someone is, is doing this or not? So that was kind of trying to unpack like what is in this, um, <clears throat> in this term. And it seemed like a very important aspect of it was being able to see everyone use that term independently of each other and whether they were speaking English or Swedish, being able to see what work needed to be done. Um, And so kind of being able to sort of read between the lines or just having this kind of perceptiveness, I would say, about what is important for us and what should I be doing without necessarily being told by someone like now you are doing this necessarily. Or it could be maybe that you have a num- bunch of tasks and that you're sort of, oh, well, I will do that and being more proactive about that. But they talked about this being able to see and being able to sort of create work tasks based on what you thought you should be doing uh, to contribute to the organization. So it was very important that it, these initiatives were aligned with organizational goals so it's not just being proactive in any direction it was very important that you were being if you were self-leading in the right direction (laughs) so that you were leading yourself where the organization wanted you to go so it's not like completely autonomous you could look at self-leadership that way more like how am i leading my life then it's not obviously that you have to tie that to any particular organization you could choose to leave the organization but this is more like in the context of an organization. So being able to to see was very important. And that's where sort of this idea of asking questions, for example, comes in. And where I said that um, managers are usually more tolerant of more junior employees asking questions without looking bad for asking questions. But if you are a more senior person, then it could, in some cases, be more problematic to ask questions if the manager thinks that you should be able to do these things without having to ask questions. So, um, and that will also probably depend a lot on, like, how well are you performing uh, in general and the culture of the organization. Like, are they... Well, do we encourage questions here or do we encourage looking perfect and competent at, at, at every time? And if you are a consultant, for example, then it could be like maybe you can ask some questions but not in front of the customer because then it's more like you do have to project this competent um, appearance, which may be more important than maybe if you're not working towards customers. Maybe it's more obvious, uh, more okay to be like I don't know this thing that I should know but I think for the organizations really it it should just like if people don't know stuff it's I mean how are they going to find out <laughs> if if they can't ask questions if that's like no well you can ask a question but you're going to look incompetent if you do then that's like not a very good um that's not very good, especially if you want your employees to be self-leading, then they have to be able to inform themselves somehow about the things that they should should be doing. And that's also in one of the other studies that was part of the doctoral thesis, we were looking at this kind of, we were looking at activity-based offices where you're, you don't have like fixed seating, <laughs> you, move, you move around, um, 
and comparing that to to other office types, either sitting in this landscape, but you have a fixed seat, or that you have this kind of cell offices where you have your own office. And we didn't actually find a big difference between in this study between the different types of offices, but we did find um, looking at a variable that we call information richness, which is related to this, like being informed about or feeling informed about um, what you should be doing. So you feel like you're sort of in the loop and that you have access to your manager if you need to, like, and that you, you have like the main thing, the core of it, I would say is like, I feel like I have the information I need to do my job. Like I have the information I need when I need it to be able to do my job well. And then you could look like what are different things. But that was um, one of the main things that were related to um, lower stress, lower cognitive stress, if you had, if you felt this way. And also being able to perform better if you had this, like I feel I have the information that I need. And I I relate that to self-leadership. And like if you are supposed to, take all these decisions about your job then and that they should also be aligned with the organization then you you need to feel informed about like what is my job what can I do where are we going um, who am I doing it with all those kinds of things the more you feel informed about that the better decisions you're going to be able to make when you are in these new situations and you are supposed to make the decisions um, so that was my main takeaway from that study. And then I did two other studies and one of them was with consultants, uh, like management consultants who had like very intense situation. They felt like, um, we probably need to be better at self leadership was their like idea. <laughs> and we interviewed them about what kind of strategies they were using to manage their intensity. And we could see that at least for them, their job was marked by being kind of very results focused. So it was, which for them meant that it was easy to work a lot because you were always focused on the results and not the hours. And for that, for them, that meant working more hours because you were focused on the results. And also having a kind of not very explicit um what was part of the job exactly and they were like we don't have that many demands but in reality we have a lot of demands but we have to we have to interpret what they are <laughs> from the from the managers like what do they expect from us they don't say it explicitly we have to like interpret um so so if you don't f- feel like you know clearly like how much work is enough Um, what kind of quality, like, is this a high quality? Like, is this good enough? If if those kinds of things are less clear, then that could also be a very stressful uh, situation, especially if it's coupled with a high motivation to perform. Like, you really want to perform, but you're not sure that you're really doing it. So that is a really dangerous situation I would say <laughs> to 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 be in and the last study was with the agile coaches at Spotify where I was looking at trying to look at what because at least I would say then with this a couple of years ago when I did it this felt like a new role and I would say in the larger definitely in the larger like research community it's still like very few people know what it is <laughs> so it's still it's still new in that sense even though I think for people like working in tech in Stockholm they're like oh that's that's not new but it, for the research community it was certainly very new um, and looking at what that role like what were they what were they doing with the teams how were they trying to enable this sort of aligned autonomy that they also talk about um, at Spotify like what are they doing so I really wanted to like what do you do so I I did some observations but mostly it was interviews with these coaches about what do you do and like very specific <laughs> what is the things that you're doing and like why are you doing them what do you think 
what is the like what are you trying to achieve by doing that so trying to get really at how they thought about it sort of causally like when i do this what happens like why are you doing this so i was really trying to to get into that and uh, then i have these different kind of behaviors that they're trying to do and a lot of it i would say is trying to achieve this better communication and it's not just communication as in people talking to each other even though that's like part of it and that's an obvious part of communication um but more like having the different parts of the organization being able to communicate with itself like <laughs> so have like so if you maybe if you're thinking about the organization like a brain or the immune system like it needs to be able to um speak to itself <laughs> like what's going on i'm sending these signals um and i saw it that the coaches were actually working a lot with that even though they had their like agile toolbox for doing it but a lot of it was about improving uh, the communication and improving the culture to have this clear communication so that you could and I, which relates to what i talked about before about being like non-judgmental um listening to others and speaking you know clearly like if you have if you know something about what's someone's talking about something and you see something that you think is wrong or that's not clear like we want you to speak up <laughs> about those things and we want to have a culture where you can speak up and it won't be interpreted as a criticism like towards the person and so on because if you have a culture where if i criticize what you say in any way then you take that very personally you and feel attacked and then maybe you get defensive to- towards me or or you get very sad <laughs> then like that becomes a situation where maybe i don't want to speak up anymore because it's not worth it's not worth it like the yeah, you basically get punished yeah um so you want to have that to be like all all those kinds of communications really ideally should be very like completely not loaded with emotion um and not like we're, who's right who's wrong and uh, not so much focus on that but more like trying to improve we are trying to yeah, improve yeah more like celebrating like let's celebrate we found something we don't understand or we found a problem now let's focus on solving it yeah, yeah. yes exactly and and that is really i would say the core of sort of acting as an organization and evolving certainly if you want to do anything that's like innovative and so on then you really you will well i don't know if you need need it but it will certainly be very helpful to have this more that you that the signals in the organization can flow where they need to go without having all these extra politics and appearances and all of that so i think that is actually very and i think that having coaches that are focusing on the process and like how are people interacting with each other that that matters a lot i think that was very um special that they had going there and i think it's a very good thing and when we talked about like what could maybe other um industries learn like from people who are working in the tech industry and working agile i think that is a, a, um something also that would be beneficial in other organization is like having roles caring deeply about like how like our our way of operating like our way of interacting with each other matters so we can't just leave that up to anyone just doing whatever they want like we want people to interact in this way because this way is better <laughs> than uh, yeah those kinds of ways and with that said do you want to add any last insights or what would you if you were to give um let's say younger knowledge workers one tip or three what would they be i think just one important thing is just like to take um your 
your thoughts seriously <laughs> like t- to believe that you you are definitely like worthy of having some time to think about things because your thoughts matter um i think that's sort of trying to like internalize that i think is good and also that it's important to have some time in your i mean i would say at work but just in your life in general where it's really you, where you're not just reacting to things and i think especially well it can, this can be different if you're sort of young and new either it could be like you're reacting to things a lot because you are like a sponge just trying to soak up everything but it could also be that you have a lot of time because sometimes you you don't get because you're not that into your role yet you you just do the things that people give you and maybe it's not that much so maybe you do have more time but it's so important to have this time where you're not reacting to things coming in but where you can either use it because you're in some focused work or if you're not doing that then to reflect just on the things that you are doing what you're learning what you should be doing and i think it's very very important because otherwise you can get like really off track completely <laughs> and sort of off track sort of in your life especially of course i'm thinking about i mean being towards burnout and stuff like that and um th- that risk is just so much bigger if you never stop to think about where am i going is this good is this like sustainable um and so being able to sort of step out of the river where everything is just going like really fast um being able to step out of that and to reflect on where you are and to like observe how you're feeling and what's going on and those kinds of things that's just like a prerequisite to be able to to like to change anything for example uh, if you want to change anything you need to be you you need to have this like be able to observe and see like is this where i want like is this the right direction i'm heading right now is this where i want to go or actually i want to, and if you're just reacting to everything that's happening then you're not doing that so i think that's really i think that is just very i think it's very important that you do those things yeah that is so wonderful because we will most probably change up our lives a few times during our lifetime. So thank you for teaching us about that and sharing your view upon it. Thank you. And I hope to have you back soon. Whew, we're done. A question. Yes. Yes. There was a question like a while ago and I really felt like teased. It was like but but what was the answer? Okay. <laughs> so you said uh the you were doing this research should we like, should we just record you as well cuz the now you're like uh do you want to do you want to just go there yeah. all right we've got Catherine Birkenshaw the research assistant uh with a brilliant burning question so we're going to pass the mic to her hi <laughs> uh so if you are comparing in your research the activity based offices versus having a fixed seat versus having your own room in these different traditional office setups um and you found a different level of information richness which as you say is this prerequisite to self leadership which one had which type of information richness or which level what what was the finding yeah um so the finding was that the information richness had an impact on the um the stress level and on performance and we did not find a big difference between the types of offices either in like the stress level or actually the level of information richness but there's 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 a there's a um a caveat here that we looked at it, we had like 500 people who were working in the activity based offices but then we had like 90 people who were working in the different uh types of offices so this is not really the best study if your main interest is 
like what are the differences between the types of offices, which I think is what you're you're getting at. And then there are maybe uh, other studies who do show differences, for example, in uh, being able to concentrate. Uh, if you have like a very focused, uh, heavy job, then working in um, a cell office is usually better. And but but the activity based offices can be they're so like they can be so different some are if they're too small then they're going to be more like working in a landscape and it's too noisy but if they're big enough then you will have actually some more private uh, locations to to sit in so this study was really looking at more at the um, like well did the office type matter and did this um, the information richness matter and then we looked at two other variables like autonomy and um well, we were looking at a variable called self-leadership, but it's a bit different than what I've been talking about here. So, um, but the activity-based offices actually had higher autonomy than the others, which I thought was interesting. Mm. Mm. That's fascinating. Wow. Ah. Thank you. I feel satisfied. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for having me. Yeah, my I, pleasure is ours. I love being on podcasts. It's so much fun. I think just, uh, I don't know, I like to talk, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what? You are so delightful to listen to. Oh, like, did, yeah. did you come up with the, the analogy of like taking time to step out of the river where everything flows so fast? Like, what a beautiful, like, zen <laughs> metaphor. Yeah. No, I mean... Uh, just pretend like... Yeah, exactly. Really, I... I'm not. I'm not sure uh, if I came up. I mean, I'm sure I've heard similar analogies sometimes. I do. I mean, I have read some like Zen or like Buddhist thoughts. I think a lot of people, also in the tech industry, right, <laughs> are influenced by B Buddhism or Buddhism light, you know, meditation and so on. But but I don't focus a lot on that at all in the book because that's a an internal method. I think it's good. I also say in the book, like mindfulness and all that, it's like, it's, it's great, but there's so much material already out there. And I wanted to speak to this sort of alternative way of thinking where you don't, you don't have to change yourself. You don't have to become a better person beforehand. Like you can change the situation so that the person that you are is going to uh, be, be better able to do these things so that um, basically I mean for me for example I was doing this PhD and like I had to consider like how is a person like me going to finish the PhD like it, it, it's pointless to think that oh what I should be more like this or I should be smarter or I should be more focused or so on like that's beside the point like this is me now and like how how can this person be able to pull this off and like that is really the focus of the book like how can the person that you are with your cognitive resources try to do difficult things <laughs> <laughs> that is so good i'm so glad we didn't stop the recording <laughs> yes yeah super okay let's get you out of here